and welcome to another A to Z of the NHS. You're joined by myself, Dr James Gill, one of the GPs around here, and one of the big dogs, Andy Stein, our renal consultant. So, we've already got our A, B and C, so carrying on that line, we're going to do Ds today. Andy, what have you brought for us? Um, I'll tell you about the Ds in a minute, but I noticed, James, that your hair seems to be growing and mine seems to be getting shorter. It's not a biological thing, it's just that I like my relationship too much to risk Beth cutting my hair at the moment. Understood. Okay. I can't wait for lockdown to be over. I'm going to do or lead on two subjects. They are diabetes, very common disease, and DVT, deep vein thrombosis. And I think you're going to lead on two others, aren't you? Yeah, I, I brought depression. Well, I haven't brought depression, but I will be discussing depression. And also something slightly topical, but kind of squeezing it in, vitamin D. It's our show. If we want to work at something, we will do. So yeah, they're, they're the two that we've got. But diabetes and DVT, it's very interesting that you're bringing those because I tend to send a lot of those cases when they're difficult and I'm unable to deal with it up to secondary care. So I'm hoping to gain some educational pearls from yourself. Well, I'll, I'll do my best, James. Um, didn't we say earlier that we were going to discuss some things in the medical news, though? So yeah, so actually, as Andy's just um, highlighted, we're going to try and add something new in, perhaps to loosen ourselves up. Just a quick review of medical news that's caught our eye. So what's, what's triggered yourself, Andy? I did read in the BMJ this week an interesting editorial that stated that the number of alcohol-related deaths is climbing, particularly related to the lockdown. So, for example, it was noted in the first nine months of last year that there were over 5,000 deaths, and that was a 16% increase in the number of alcohol-related deaths compared to the previous year. So I think the go-home message is that we all have to be careful about how much we're drinking during the lockdown and also not going too berserk after the lockdown. Well, I actually read that same article. It and I was a little bit troubled, not so much by the lockdown, but the actual looking backwards. So there's been a between 16 and 9% increase in alcohol-related deaths for actually the last few years, even before the lockdown. So it shows that perhaps in the UK we've got an alcohol issue that you know, the lockdown has brought to the fore. It's definitely something we need to look into. I think so, and I don't quite know why Brits like their booze so much, but they do. So perhaps that's something as our first public health message today, because we're going to be talking about lots of subjects where, if in doubt, talk to your GP. If you, or somebody that you know, you're concerned about alcohol, get them to talk to their doctor. It's not necessarily a problem, and they may find that there is no issue at all. But if in doubt, have a chat. Tell me what you've read in the medical literature recently, James. Well, I've actually seen something, a, a new drug that's being trialled in Glasgow, which unfortunately I've just forgotten, but we will put up the name in a moment. And that's to do with endometriosis. Now, the thing that I found fascinating about this, it's not a hormonal medication. Now, a lot of the treatments we use for um, endometriosis rely on adjusting a, a lady's um, monthly hormones which means that, unfortunately, it's going to stop them having children whilst we're trying to deal with those issues. And this is a new drug that looks at lactate that tries to reduce the pain and the discomfort from endometriosis, allowing people to pursue their families if they want to. How interesting. I must admit, um, if you asked me to say two facts about endometriosis, I would struggle. I think I need to do a bit of reading, but I know it's an important disease and very painful for a lot of women out there. Well, I was very surprised that a medication to deal with lactate has been investigated, because as we discussed on the ABG, lactate's in more, more in your world than mine. It is, yes. It's something we measure in very ill patients. Um, if you remember, I mentioned the arterial blood gas test, and it's a very important number we measure to look for sepsis and other things. So I'm surprised it's got anything to do with endometriosis, but clearly it does. Apparently endometriotic tissue has a higher lactate turnover than others, and that's the route they're looking at it with. Oh, really? And they're thinking that because of that, there's also been some research that endometriosis may, amazingly, share some links with asthma. So they're thinking they may be able to repurpose or adjust some existing asthma medications for endometriosis. Wow, that certainly, is interesting. Certainly some very interesting things. Well, so that's our, that's our brief review of things that um, we think are worthwhile. If you'd like us to carry on with these medical reviews, drop us a comment down below. 
So, with the news out of the way, shall we start off with our DVT or di uh, diabetes? Which do you want to go for? I think we'll go for diabetes because diabetes in many ways is not new and it's not in the news. In fact, it's a very ancient disease. Um, first of all, I thought it'd be worth educating us all in terms of the origins of the word diabetes and mellitus. The full name for diabetes is diabetes mellitus. You will of course know, James, the Greek origins of these words. Oh, I thought he was going to go Latin, not Greek. Go on then, give us some Greek. Anyway, the word diabetes comes from the word siphon and it was to do with the fact that the Greeks and the ancient Egyptians before them realised that the polyuria that you get in some patients with diabetes is like a liquid passing through a tube or a siphon. So that's where the word diabetes comes from and the word mellitus means honeyed or sweet. So what it really means is honeyed or sweet stuff passing through uh, a tube or siphon uh, and I find it interesting that uh, our knowledge about diabetes hasn't really uh, gone on much further from the, the Greeks and the Egyptians. Well neither has your spiel because I am pretty confident I've heard that similar line when I was a first year one of your students. <laughs> it is story 472, yes. Anyway, let's move on uh, to diabetes. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is an incredibly common condition and we'll go on to the epidemiology in a minute. Um, it's basically a chronic, that means lifelong condition characterized by high blood glucose levels or hyperglycemia is the technical word for it. Um, it's common and getting commoner. What's the UK percentage, do you know? Um, it's about 4 million. There are about 4 million people with it in the UK out of a population of 67 million-ish. And there's about another 1 million people out there who have it and don't know it. Mm -hmm. and that, that's a real worry. So what does that mean in terms of percentages or fractions? It basically it means about 1 in 20 of the population, about 5% have diabetes. But if you start looking at subgroups, for example, people over 40, people like me, you're getting up to about 1 in 10, in other words, 10% of the population. And this makes it one of the commonest, in fact, the most common chronic medical condition. And I think from my perspective, as a GP seeing a lot of diabetes, I'm looking at this both with a patient hat on, but also a financial hat, given you know, that such a huge number of people can be affected by this condition, that potentially means that there's the ability to cost such a huge amount, both in terms of patient suffering, but also financially for the NHS. So if we can hit these patients hard, improve their diabetes, maybe even cure it or put it into remission, we will improve their quality of life in the long term and hopefully not bankrupt the service too. Let's talk about how we diagnose it now. Um, fortunately it's quite simple to diagnose, you just do a blood glucose level. I thought you were going to go Greek on us then, you know how they used to diagnose it in Greece, don't you? Well in Greece and other cultures they used to taste the patient's urine mm -hmm. from my memory and, uh, and it should be sweet. Well, shouldn't be sweet, but in a diabetic it'll be sweet. Correct, correct. We've slightly moved on from that and we've stopped, well, stopped usually tasting the patient's urine viewers. Um, back to the diagnosis. So the normal blood sugar, uh, as you will know, is approximately four to six millimoles per litre. Now we diagnose diabetes if the fasting blood glucose is over seven or the random blood glucose is over 11. So it's quite a, a simple diagnosis. Um, and I think it's important that if a patient has those sort of numbers that they're repeated within two weeks. So the GP or the hospital doctor who's looking after a patient with new diabetes is certain they've got it. Do these sort of patients ever present to you? Occasionally, and they tend to come down from yourself at secondary care, perhaps somebody's been into the A&E department and they've been found to have a high glucose and we need to look a little bit further. But as you say, those two readings are important. But there's another reading that I'm particularly passionate about in GP land, and that's the HbA1c. Now, with a regular random or fasting glucose, there are things that patients can do to prepare for a test because we all want to look good. However, with an HbA1c, you can't. That looks at the blood over the last three months. So if someone's done really, really well with their diet and they've reduced their carbohydrates and they've really pushed things, we will see that in a three-month panel. 
but conversely, if they've not been quite as effective, we'll also see that too. And this HbA1c number is important in terms of the diagnosis as well as not just the monitoring. So another way of diagnosing diabetes is to do an HbA1c. And the bottom line is if it's over 48, you've got diabetes. If it's under 42, you haven't. And if it's in between, you've got something in between. And we call that pre-diabetes or sometimes impaired glucose tolerance. It's got a, a variety of names. But the HbA1c is almost as important as the actual blood glucose. Diagnostically, I actually prefer, and treatingly, I prefer it because I've got more granularity. And as you said, those pre-diabetic patients, they're the ones I really want to get my hands on because we may be able to turn things around and stop it going to diabetes. Sure, and if there's anything you can do, anything we can do to stop people progressing from pre-diabetes to diabetes, then that's a, a really good thing. In terms of the targets, I'm not going to talk about that in great detail today because these have to be individualised to the patient. But the bottom line is the target, the best target is normality. In other words, I aim to get the fasting blood glucose below 7, the random blood glucose below 11 and the HbA1c below 42. With a lot of my patients that have got blood glucose meters at home because they're, they're checking and often they're not sure what the readings mean, I'm happy for them to be reviewed as is planned, but I do tell them if the number goes over 15, I don't mind what time of day it is, I need to know about that because it may mean that we actually need to send them to the hospital, hopefully not, but if it's 15, I want to know what's going on there. I think 15 is a good danger line and if a patient has a random blood glucose of 15 or over on a Friday, it might be 25 on Sunday and they might be unconscious on Monday. And So I think 15 is a good line when you've got to actually start thinking about I may have to do something today. I'd like now to talk about risk factors for diabetes. Um, there's essentially four or four big ones. There's three that you can't affect and one that you can. The three that you can't affect are your age. As you get older, like me, you're more likely to get diabetes. Your race, people from ethnic minority groups are more likely to get diabetes, sadly, probably about three times more likely. In fact, there is a group of Native American Indian called a Pima Indian, and 50% of those people have diabetes, sadly. 50%, it's incredible. So apart from age uh, and race, the other important risk factor is family history. Now, what we've been talking about so far, uh, as I expect you will have guessed viewers, is type 2 diabetes. And in fact, type 2 diabetes is now 90% of the diabetic population, so it is largely the disease that we talk about when we do uh, sessions like this. As you say, the, there is that family connection, and I try to, you know, obviously type 1, if, if someone in the family has that, it's something that the genetics we're not going to be able to change. But type 2 has much stronger environmental factors. So when I'm dealing with patients who are worried that their relatives have had type 2 diabetes, I try to reassure them that this is something that we can look to prevent and manage and hopefully prevent them going down that same line. Yes, and in fact this third risk factor, which is family history, is very important. It is true that if you are Asian and both your parents have diabetes, you have a 90% chance of developing diabetes yourself, which I find staggering. And if one of your parents has diabetes, you've still got a 50% chance of getting diabetes. Again, a very high percentage. Uh, the final, and in some ways the most important risk factor, is your weight. Obesity, we've talked about in a previous video, we talked about it in our BMI video, is now the epidemic of our time. And sadly, 60% of the British population is overweight or obese. And that can be altered. That is a significant risk factor for diabetes. In fact, the diabetes epidemic is largely because it mirrors the obesity epidemic. So we talk about uh, diabetes. Um, how, you know, what, what's the, what kind of things, what symptoms might people get? How might this present the first time? Interestingly, the commonest way it presents is with an asymptomatic patient. In other words, they don't know they've got diabetes. They don't have any symptoms. They, for example, go into hospital for an operation or have an acute illness. Somebody measures a random blood glucose and it comes back at 12.8. And that's how we pick up diabetes in the modern age. 
The other ways it tends to present are either with the symptoms of diabetes, and these include polydipsia, polyuria, that means being too thirsty or, or passing too much urine, or in another way, in other words, with a complication of diabetes, such as an eye problem or a kidney problem, for example. I'm surprised at the number of patients who actually come to us um, having had suspected diabetes picked up at the opticians, actually, when they do the retinal photography looking behind the eye. Absolutely, and in fact, um, I think we owe a debt of gratitude to all the optometrists out there because I've seen them diagnose both diabetes and severe hypertension just by looking in the back of somebody's eye. And the reason it's so fascinating is that the fundi, which is the thing that we see at the back of the eye, shows us blood vessels in great detail. In fact, it's the only bit of the body where you can see a small artery uh, and it's a great skill to have to be able to look at the fundi. Unfortunately I think in general practice you don't usually have enough time to look at the fundi do you? We do always try but unfortunately we don't have the drops to be able to dilate the eye to get the best view from it. But I think that point about the eyes is really indicative of diabetes. There is not a single part of the body that escapes the ravages of diabetes, which is one of the reasons we're so passionate about fighting this disease. The thing that worries me more than the disease is actually the complications, or the complications of the disease. Um, and these are nasty. Mm -hmm. So let's just go through them. They can be largely divided up into large vessel complications and small vessel. The large vessel complications include ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, and reno, that means kidney vascular disease. And diabetes, for reasons we don't really understand, accelerates atheroma and causes large vessel disease. The way I've kind of thought of a lot of those things is, you said the large and small vessel disease, it's more you know, um, clear and invisible. You know, the patients that have got you know, problems with their kidneys, they have problems with their strokes, they're losing damage to their limbs. That's all the sort of things we're talking about there, isn't it? Absolutely. And as well as those large vessel complications, we have the small vessel complications that you've just alluded to. And so if a patient has diabetes for more than 10 years, they also get problems in their small vessels, particularly in the eyes, in the kidneys again, and in the feet. They get something called neuropathy in the feet. Um, so we have four large vessel complications and three small vessel complications related to diabetes. I've got a couple of patients with diabetic neuropathy and they, they complain of pins and needles to the feet and things like that. And I have a, you know, what I thought was appropriate sympathy for them and things like that. And I uh, got myself an injury at one point and I uh, damaged one of the nerves briefly. And I didn't fully comprehend how significant a neuropathy is. The pins and needles, which we've all had before, and I just attributed that. Pins and needles that you cannot control and that you can't do anything about. It really does completely take your focus away from the rest of your life for that time being that you've got it. And I'm so grateful mine was just transient. Hence, and I really, really you know, do try hard with those patients to find a medication where pins and needles is reduced without giving them sufficient side effects. It's huge, I think, neuropathy. In fact, I've got a friend who's got a neuropathy affecting both of her legs, and this causes her a lot of pain, a lot of symptoms all the time. And despite medication, sadly, it's only partially controlled. One thing I'd like to talk about now is I'd just like to take a, a slight aside into a very simple question which has been troubling me for many decades, and that is why and how? How does diabetes do its damage? The answer to that question is we don't know. And I think it's fascinating that um, human beings have recognized diabetes since the time of the Greeks and the Egyptians, and we still don't know why it's bad for us. There are a variety of theories. The commonest and uh, most popular theory is a rather simple one, that it's the high blood glucose. And you might think, well, that's obvious. That must be the thing that causes the damage. It's surprisingly difficult to prove. And remember, there are other metabolic things going on, such as the insulin levels, which may be high or low. We're going to talk about that again in a minute. 
Um, it could be growth hormone, it could be blood pressure, it could be all sorts of other things, but we don't really know how diabetes does its damage. It seems that the glucose molecules attach themselves to a variety of proteins, including something called enzymes. This process is called glycation, and this in some ways damages both the structure and function of those, of those proteins and enzymes. Again, just going back to the fact that I'm a bear, a very simple brain, I've all just thought that diabetes is too much sugar and it gums up the works. It is interesting though, we don't really understand, even if the blood sugar does damage the proteins and enzymes, what consequence is there of that? And it's thought that in some way, affecting the structure and function of these proteins and enzymes, that causes a certain fragility in the tissues, particularly in the blood vessels. Okay, so we've got our patient and unfortunately, you know, their HbA1c has crossed that threshold of 48 and the, the works are beginning to gum up with the high levels of sugar. Um, what are we going to do about it now, Andy? There's lots we can do. Uh, the first thing is, as ever, to address lifestyle. Particularly if the patient is overweight or obese, there's a lot you can do. And if you can persuade the patient to lose weight, the diabetes can go away completely. And in fact, that's one of the most amazing things about helping somebody with diabetes. You can get it to go away completely. This does require a lot of weight loss, and that takes months or years, but it's possible. And I've got a couple of patients where I've helped them trim down and their diabetes has gone away completely. It doesn't really go away, but it's always in the background, but it has become a controllable phenomenon. Have you ever seen that yourself, James? Actually, I've seen it with quite a few patients, but I'm sure there's quite a few celebrities out there that you'll be aware of. Two of the, uh, my favorite people to watch anyway, Penn and Teller, amazing magicians. Uh, uh, I think Penn, the larger of the two, he had quite a health scare and as a result of that he's been able to lose so much weight and put his diabetes into remission. Really? Isn't there a Labour politician that had diabetes well, and lost weight? Ex-politician Tom Watson and not going down the political side of things, I'm aggrieved as a doctor that we've lost someone in the political sphere who had and understands the importance of diabetes because I think that he was famed for the sizes of his lunches um, in the House of Parliament and he gained quite a lot of weight um, which put him into diabetes but conversely he cut out carbohydrate, he slimmed down tremendously and was able to kick his diabetes in and I think having people that we can see yes someone's had the problem and how they've overcome it can be great role models for us both as patients and as clinicians. Good well it's good that people out there are admitting they have diabetes and telling us and telling us about their weight loss and how important that is. But sometimes even that is not enough and doctors have to start a variety of tablets. So there's some very traditional tablets that were around in my day at medical school. There's a group of drugs called biquinides, a particular drug called metformin, which is still used. There's another group of drugs called sulfonylureas, particularly a drug called glyclozide. Not a fan of glyclozide anymore, I well, must admit. There's three or four uh, new drugs in diabetes, and they have a complicated name, so I'm just going to look at my crib sheet Oh, here. but there's some sexy drugs there, there really are. One of them is called the GLP-1 analog or analogs, another group, SGLT2. Now that is a sexy medication. That is a sexy medication. Right, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in here. This is science elegance. So I tell you what, let's, let's work this through. Andy, what, what, was, what, were, what was it that you told us were the original symptoms? What do people tend to present with? They present with polydipsia and, and polyuria, and the cause of that is an osmotic diuresis related to the glucose in the urine. So we get sugar in the urine, and that's pulling water with it. Terrible symptom. Some amazing person worked out that all of the sugar gets pulled into the urine and there are receptors that then try and pull it back in in the normal kidney. What they did is they blocked this reuptake um, uh, channel so the diabetes dumps the sugar into the urine and this drug leaves it there. So we lose so much sugar into the urine and that brings the blood pressure down as well. It helps with weight loss because they're losing calories from that perspective. 
but, and this is probably where Andy's not going to be too happy with me, being overly enthusiastic with this, I'm, you, I'm essentially abusing your kidney to get that sugar out, aren't I? Yeah, you are a bit, but I'm for any drug that makes the patient better by, by whatever method. There's a final group of drugs, the DPP4 inhibitors. They usually end in a suffix like gliptin, for example, uh, and they're another one of the m more modern drugs used in diabetes. But I know they've got some great benefits. Do they? Yeah, well, think of the, with a patient with diabetes, where possible, we want them to try and lose weight and we get that benefit with the DPP-4 inhibitors, that weight loss, so we reduce the fat which um, then means that diabetes improves even further with it. So again, I know they're expensive, I know that they have potential side effects, but the patients that I've seen using these do tend to do so very well. Finally, if the tablets don't work, we have to resort to insulin. Um, it may be necessary for patients with type 2 diabetes, particularly if they've had the disease for some years and the tablets have stopped working, the pancreas gets exhausted and we have to use insulin in these patients. I, re I really feel sorry for patients, not because they're going on insulin, but the perception of it. The number of times I have to fight and cajole and reassure patients that actually Things aren't, haven't gone well from a medical perspective and we need to go on to insulin. And you frequently see this fear in their face. But I am very, very pro starting medications and also reducing them. And if we need to stabilise somebody for a few months, maybe a couple of years with insulin, whilst they are able to focus on their weight, maybe look at, as we discussed on the BMI video, bariatric surgery, there's no reason we can't stop something. Actually, I have a story for you, James, about that. Um, I have a patient, a lady, um, who was on dialysis. Um, she was on dialysis because she was in kidney failure, because of diabetes, because of obesity. And I was able to both slim her down with bariatric surgery, make her diabetes go away, and also persuade a transplant surgeon to transplant her. And now she's alive and well with a functioning kidney transplant and no diabetes. Cracking, cracking. And, and this, this, this is the thing, we have, this is a, a disease that we have the ability to change but there is fear around it in terms of how difficult it will be to change and there's reluctance because of lifestyle changes and that that for me is such a tragedy in many ways because as you see sometimes people get to the end of the line and then they will make the hard decisions with their doctors but it does save them true true the final thing i'd like to talk about is who to refer now, as you know, you're a family doctor, a GP, I'm a hospital doctor. You work a lot harder than I do. When you do a clinic, you see about 20 patients. When I do a clinic, it's 10 patients or less. But of those 20, about one in 20 on average, you refer up to the hospital for some reason. And I think it's hard for you to know with patients with diabetes about who to refer. There is, however, hope out there. There is a new concept, a new phrase, which is super six. I don't know, have you heard of that phrase? Uh, we've heard it discussed, but tell me about it. Okay, so basically this phrase has been developed to help both you as a GP and the general public to know, do they need to see a hospital doctor as well as their GP? And the answer is, for most patients, they don't. But if they have any of the following six conditions, they probably do. And the first two are pregnancy and pump, pump meaning the heart, in other words, pump failure, heart failure, those patients do need to have joint care with somebody like me. Renal, kidneys, my area, they should be referred to people like me if their diabetic nephropathy is bad enough. Ulcers, leg ulcers, need to be referred to a diabetic foot clinic. Leg ulcers can rapidly turn to gangrene and other things and they can be treated and they can be got rid of. I have had two patients that have had gas gangrene and I'll be perfectly honest, when I was at medical school, I thought gas gangrene and stuff like that, it's, it's war stories and things like that. I did not expect to see, you know, in 2010, a patient with gas gangrene. I really didn't and that was diabetes. Incredible, incredible. And, and it, it, I'll be honest, it is as horrific as it sounds. The guy came in, 
Um, a very bright chap, and he'd, he'd missed the fact that he couldn't feel his feet because it had just come so insidiously. And he'd stubbed his toe about a week or two before, and he was just a little bit unwell. He wasn't really bad. Do you know why he'd actually come to the doctors? Because his mate said he smelt. And I thought, that, that's, that's really something. And I saw it on the triage sheet, and I thought, really? Really? It was the gas gangrene. And uh, the guy, we 999 the guy up to the hospital, and he had his leg amputated within four hours. But uh, again, this is why that diabetes it can come up so, so insidiously that people don't know about it, which is one of the reasons why whenever a patient says, can I have a health check? The answer is yes, and I always put a diabetic screen on that patient. Finally, there are two other groups where hospital doctors should either be involved or the patient should be referred to people like us, and they are young patients with diabetes and hospital inpatients where the diabetes is a problem. We've seen the video that Vinod Patel did, and some of the, the diabetic team, they're like yourself in the renal team, you're always happy to pick up the phone and just give us a bit of advice. Right, I think that's enough about diabetes. I think we should move on to the next subject, which I think is vitamin D. Is that right, James? Absolutely. I'm going to sort of, you know, skew the ABC and we'll put vitamin D in here.